Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center virtual lecture of the month of June. Um, my, my name is uh, Maxime Lamoureux saint hilaire and today I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Zender, who's going to be giving us uh, an exciting lecture about uh, the arrival of Maya writing in the northern Yucatan. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce uh, Mark Zender in particular because he is an important uh, mentor in my life. Um, Mark and I arrived in uh, New Orleans at uh, Tulane University the same year, him as a, a professor and uh, me as a student, graduate student. So uh, our paths crossed in 2011 or maybe a year before that even. And since then, uh, we've uh, been uh, good colleagues and close friends. So I'm excited to be able to introduce him uh, as part of our lecture series at the Boundary and Archaeology Center. Um, before I go ahead and introduce him, I would just like to mention that um, as this is streamed live on YouTube, you can ask questions uh, through the YouTube chat and uh, we will answer them live uh, at the end of the lecture. So, um, and I will uh, explain that in the chat how, as well throughout the talk. I'm sorry if there's some background sound, I'm not at my normal, uh, home office here, uh, or at my actual office, I'm in a hotel in St. Louis, uh, doing a, 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 cr a cross trek across the entire uh, United States to go to Colorado from North Carolina. <laughs> so, um, all right. Now, um, Mark Zender received his PhD from the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Calgary in 2004. He has since taught at the University of Calgary and Harvard University. And he is now Associate Professor of Anthropology at Tulane University, where he teaches linguistics, epigraphy, and Mesoamerican indigenous languages such as Yucatec and Chorti, both Mayan languages, and classical and modern Nahuatl of the Uto Aztecan language family. Um, Dr. Zender's research interests include anthropological and historical linguistics, comparative writing systems, digital epigraphy. Um, and archaeological decipherment with a regional focus on Mesoamerica, particularly Mayan and Nahuatl Aztec. In addition to this, uh, Dr. Mark Zender is a renowned Tolkienist. He uh, studies all the languages of Middle Earth and is uh, a consultant uh, for all things related to the Lord of the Rings. So if you ever have questions about this topic, he's always happy to discuss it as well. Elvish uh, is, is, is a specialty of his as well. He has authored several books and dozens of articles exploring uh, these and related subjects, and here I'm um, not talking about Tolkien, but rather about the uh, Mesoamerican writing systems and languages. In addition to his teaching, research, and writing, Dr. Zender is the editor of the Pari Journal and a frequent contributor to MesoWeb, a major internet resource for the study of Mesoamerican cultures. He's also recently contributed an article and is uh, co-authoring another, another article for The Mayanist, uh, the journal uh, that we published through afar. And so uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Zender. Um, and so uh, Mark, please unmute yourself and uh, the floor is yours. I will return at the end to help with the Q&A, but until then um, I will uh, become invisible and muted. Well, thank you so much, Max, for that lovely introduction. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, I hope that everybody who's tuning in uh, will uh, enjoy the talk. So without any further ado, let me launch into uh, the topic, which is how writing came to Northern Yucatan. And, and it's important at the very, very outset here to stress that I am talking about writing rather than language as such, although that becomes an important part of this story. Um, there are multiple writing systems in Mesoamerica, as many of you know. In fact, depending on how one counts them, there's about a dozen different writing systems. And yet there's a lot of interaction among these writing systems over the course of about two millennia. Um, there is also very strong indication that these writing systems are all related to one another. Um, that shouldn't be a big surprise. Most of the writing systems that are being used across the planet today are related to one another. We probably have about a half dozen, um, you know, um, inventions of writing that owe nothing to say an earlier writing system or a combined one. And with the close juxtaposition of all these systems in Mesoamerica and their closeness in time, it stands to reason that many of them will be related one to another. 
And indeed, Mayan, um, being, having been used over about 2,000 years, is the one that's contemporary with all of the rest. And we see borrowings of signs from Mayan into other writing systems and vice versa. And neck and neck in the middle of the first millennium uh, BC, we have Mayan and Olmec and Zapotec writing with many shared signs and conventions, a specialist in each of these systems is recognized. The indication is that they probably all descend from a common ancestor that sadly no longer exists. We don't have it preserved in stone. It was more than likely something that was being used in a perishable medium like paper. Um, we have bark beaters for paper just at about the right time period, 1000 BC and slightly earlier, um, indicating a time when paper was being manufactured in large amounts and there may well have been a nascent writing system at that time. We can say a few things of what that early writing system might have looked like, but what we're more interested in today is the development of Maya hieroglyphic writing. And it's important not to think of that too much as a unity either. Maya writing changed a lot from about 500 BC until it passes out of use in the 16th century. It's a 2000 year span. And although it's originally associated with one particular part of the Mayan family tree of languages, it gets adopted by speakers of other Mayan languages over time and undergoes changes to better represent those other languages. And that's part of what I wanna talk about today. Mayan can seem like a gigantic unity, you know, a single kind of monolithic entity. But of course, if we take a closer look at this area where we have Maya hieroglyphic writing, we actually find a lot of linguistic and cultural variation. Right? Uh, we're looking at some 33 known languages, um, some of which have become extinct since their first documentation, some 30 Mayan languages still being spoken today, and a lot, therefore, of cultural and linguistic variability. We can um, boil away some of the variation if we move back in time a little bit, three or 400 years, to the onset of documentation in these languages um, by um, the early colonial enterprise, particularly Franciscan missionaries and later settlers of this region, where we find, for instance, that a close group of languages that we call Yucatecan, as linguists, Yucatecan, Lacandon, Itza, and Mopan, were contiguous in their territory three to 400 years ago. The Cholan family of languages is a group of languages. Um, now, of course, Cholti has become extinct and Akalan Chontal, but we can still see where these were spoken in one broad band of closely related languages. And to the south of this region, we have several other branches of the family. Tzeltalan was actually quite closely related to Cholan as kind of close cousins. Kanhobalan a little bit more distantly, but those branches, Cholan, Tzeltalan, and Kanhobalan comprise what linguists call Western Mayan as their own kind of node or part of the family tree. And then Mamean and Kichean are often called Eastern Mayan and they form another node or comprise another node of the family. We can see them schematically here, all of them descending from Proto-Mayan, but some of them more closely related to one another than to others. We have distant branches of the family and pretty close ones. And this is a useful way um, to have a look at the language and languages that Maya writing was associated with. So we have the onset then of Maya writing presumably borrowed from an earlier precursor script that we don't have anymore. And it's adaptation originally within a Cholan Celtalan linguistic frame. When we see our larger number of inscriptions beginning at the classic period um, after the BC AD transition, they're written predominantly in Cholan and they become closely associated with an Eastern Cholan branch of languages. So I'll point out in a moment. But we have a long tradition and a long span um, here. And we do have that writing system being developed um, from its origins in this kind of a frame. And then we have it being borrowed in other parts of the Maya area to write other Maya languages. Its borrowing begins as best we can see in the fifth century AD in the north. And it is employed in that region, as we'll see shortly, to write Cholan Saltalan. That is to say, we have what are presumably the ancestors of modern Yucatecan languages speaking some early ancestral form of their own language, but they're borrowing a foreign script from the south and they're writing in the foreign language that came with that script that was first designed to write in the Maya area. And after about three centuries of writing in the system and writing a foreign language in the system, they begin to experiment writing their own language, Yucatecan, while nonetheless continuing to write this prestigious language of the South right alongside it. 
Um, and I'll show you what the evidence is for that shortly. But I wanted to set the stage here, as it were, for what it is precisely I'll be talking about. I'm talking about one writing system, but it's borrowing to write the language that it was originally associated with by a completely different group. But then eventually they're adapting that system to write and record their own language, right? So let's look at what I mean by this Trollen Seltalen language that was associated with the script from its inception. And one striking thing that we've learned in the last 20 years of study of the Mayan inscriptions wherever they're written is whether we find them during the classic period at Copan or at Comacalco far off in the west or at Ecapalam far off in the north, we're writing one and the same language. There's a little bit of differences and distinctions in different areas, but by and large, it's the same grammar. Um, it's the same phonology. There's one language that's associated with this writing system in the same way that the Roman alphabet originally spread in association with Latin, right? It was only later adopted to write other languages. This was first recognized or put in print in 2000 uh, by Houston et al, um, where they noted the classic Mayan inscriptions composed in the six centuries between about 250 and 850 AD convey a single coherent prestige language ancestral to the so-called Eastern Cholan languages, the historically attested Cholti language and its descendant, modern Chorti. And the evidence for this comprises several different um, modular features, if you will, of the given language in question. It's morphology, which is to say it's grammatical apparatus. Um, it's phonology, that is to say it's sounds, both the sounds preceding the time period when we see the writing, the sounds that are changing as we see the writing being written over those centuries, and even afterwards. And even acrophony, which is the origins of some of the signs in the system. So the syllable B, which looks like a footprint, had to come from the Cholan word B, which has the sound change E to E that we see up here in phonology. In Yucatec, or indeed other Mayan languages outside of Cholan, um, we find B as the road, uh, as the word for road, right? We even find a few signs that are specific to one particular branch of Cholan or Eastern Cholan. So the syllable me, I pointed out some years ago, derives directly from the word mech, which on present evidence is only an Eastern Cholan lexeme, an Eastern Cholan word. So it seems quite clear that Cholan more generally, and perhaps even Eastern Cholan specifically, was involved in the invention of a large part of the writing system we see. A corollary to that is the remarkable impact of the Cholan family of languages and perhaps Eastern Cholan, although that's hard to demonstrate specifically, on Yucatecan. So we have a large number of loan words, clear evidence of um, a cultural and a linguistic impact of these Cholan speakers of classic Maya civilization of the Southern Maya lowlands on speakers of this language ancestral to modern Yucatec, Itza, Mopan, and Lacandon. These are two dozen forms that we know came from Cholan and went into Yucatecan because of the sounds that they have and their features. They reflect some of these sound changes that are unique to Cholan languages. They only had that history there and then were transplanted into the north. Chach is a great example, the name for the rain god. The native term in northern Yucatan would have had an initial K. Kawak, in fact, preserves that in colonial documents. Chach is it underwent the sound changes in Cholan before it was loaned to the north. But these 24 words that I have here are just the tip of an iceberg because there are many hundreds of other words that almost surely moved from the south to the north, but aren't immediately recognizable as having moved in that direction. They're just widely shared terms, as Justice and all pointed out in the 1980s, um, that we can't point uh, to their phonology is clearly indicating a move in one direction, but we can use these almost as an indication that most of those other terms probably move this way as well. Terms for religion, terms for the calendar, terms for the natural world, terms for tools and implements and items of trade like cotton, a tremendous cultural impact as well as a linguistic impact that are part and parcel of the Northern peoples having borrowed a writing system from this group to the South. Now, obviously, something like this widespread language and writing system across this entire zone isn't something that's going to have sprung up overnight. And as you might well imagine, we can trace its development 
um, if we look at the earliest Mayan inscriptions we have, they're not spread across this whole region. We find them concentrated in the center. We find early monuments at El Mirador. Um, we find early mural inscriptions at San Bartolo. This is where we find this time period in the years BC, the late pre-classic period. And then into the early classic period, we find some nascent, very early inscriptions at Huachatun and other places in this central Paten region. And so if we take a look at some of those inscriptions and what we can say about them, in particular, those that are involved in several phases of the mural programs and painting programs at San Bartolo, we can find what is at present at least our earliest attested um, example of Maya writing. And many of these early inscriptions we cannot access to the extent that we would like to in terms of talking about their morphology, their phonology, whether or not they're specifically associated with Cholan Seltalan. But when in this same central region, we first see pieces of evidence of the sounds that are involved in the system, we see them being entirely in a Cholan Seltalan matrix. That seems to be the language that's involved with this early system. This goes part and parcel with the royal iconography and the art style of the time period, right? So that we, for instance, see depictions um, that come directly out of Maya mythology, creation narratives, um, as has been uh, you know, well, well detailed by the um, scholars and the artists that are working on the San Bartolo project, Carl Taub's study of the iconography, here Heather Hurst's uh, marvelous reconstruction painting where we see the maze god inside um, a great uh, turtle shell with uh, deities of water, you know, falling water and standing water, and in particular, Chach, the Cholan thunder god. There's just a couple of iconographic signatures here that I wanted to point out, drawing on Karl Tauba's important work of the history and development of this deity, where we have the sort of thunderhead um, uh, design um, right up over the, over the eye, often forming the entire forehead, and then uh, a jade or shell ear flare, which is a common feature. Also, although we don't see it in this depiction, very frequently a snake representing rain clouds or even thunder and lightning coming out of the mouth of this being. Contemporary with this, um, or even just a little bit later, El Mirador Stila II shows this deity in all of his uh, glory right here, looking at a small, um, a few examples of early preserved hieroglyphic signs at El Mirador. So you can see the shell ear flare here, and the thunderhead over the nose and eye, open mouth and snake indeed, coming out of the mouth of chalk, and a couple of hieroglyphs. Again, very, very difficult to make much out of these, but we clearly have some bars and dots here. And we clearly have the early sign Imish, the first day of the Maya calendar. But what's remarkable about it, as we can see here in, in Bruce Love's detailed photo, is a null superfix, which probably, as John Justison in another context was the first to point this out, reflects an early Cholan exclusive term for Imish, which was something like Nalchan. It seems like this might be an indication that they were looking at this already at somewhere between 50 BC and AD 50. Broadly contemporary at Dos Aguadas, this mask that was uncovered uh, by Francisco Estrada Belli shows the rain god in all of his glory. Not just murals, not just steely, but also large stucco masks on the sides of buildings where you can see here the great thunderhead above the eye. You can see the large jade, uh, or I should say the large cut shell ear flare, even with water raindrops stylized falling from both the ear shell and being cried out, right, as tears from the rain god's eyes coming out of the mouth, the, the great thunder clouds, this sort of black or dark image that's really common in um, heavy rain bearing clouds in my iconography. So one of the reasons for pointing out this kind of twinned association of the writing and what it was referring to, you know, for instance, these deities, the deity Chach, is that we start to see this in contemporary and later inscriptions of the Pacific littoral. So at Cabinalhuyu in the Pacific littoral of Guatemala and at, and at Isapa in the Pacific littoral of Chiapas in, in Mexico, we see the same writing and the same iconography as a transplant from its place of genesis to the south something that has been pointed out in recent years um, because of the redating of these monuments from Kaminao Hiyu and Isapa uh, by Takeshi Inomata and Lucia Henderson. And David Stewart in particular has led the reanalysis of some of the implications that this holds for where Maya writing was first turned into, a system that traveled alongside a language. 
So in Kaminao Huyu, um, or at Kaminao Huyu, we can see here, for instance, a somewhat battered monument that nonetheless preserves a, a fair amount of writing. So here in a, a lovely ortho mosaic by Alex Tukovanin and a very clear drawing by Lucia Henderson. You can see a couple of things that several scholars have pointed out um, over time. Um, David Moore Marin conducted a full um, study of this particular inscription, pointing out some Cholan elements that were pretty clear in it. And David Stewart had earlier pointed out um, that, for instance, we have what must be the date 10 Chikchan here with a clear Chi syllable indicating the Cholan palatalization, uh, Cholan phonology. And indeed, we see the number six out here in front of what seems pretty clearly to be Emish, and that would indeed be four days prior to 10 Chikchan, a good indication we're looking at six Emish with that same superfix. There's really good indications and elsewhere in this inscription that we're looking at a Cholan inscription as a kind of um, example of a transplanting or moving um, into the Southern area from its birthplace, um, the um, Northern Paten, the Southern Maya Lowlands. We also have this stylistic element that's very widespread. That is to say a day sign here, eight muluk inside this um, example of a patch of blood or a smear of blood circling uh, the day sign as has been pointed out um, by David Stewart. These are spread quite widely over time and space. We have our earliest examples also in full color indicating that indeed we're looking at a blood marking around these day signs in the central Paten, but we also find them far off to the south and even far off to the northwest right at Haina. Um, so this is the spread then of a lowland Maya writing system to the far north and to the far south in its iconography, in the language that it bears, right? And uh, attendant to that is an iconographic signature of presumably a religious cult or myth mythological beliefs that spread along with that writing system and language. This great depiction of chalk with identical iconography to what we see earlier in the central Paten um, with that great thunderhead. And I should mention here that I've taken this marking in blue and green of the, of the element in the forehead and of the, and of the ear spool um, from a great short paper by James Doyle and, and Stephen Houston that you can find um, online. So clear spread of these things uh, towards the south. Now this late pre-classic, um, uh, borrowing of this northern writing system um, to write a foreign language to the north doesn't continue beyond the, the late pre-classic period. And so we have a disruption here and we don't have Maya writing and this particular Maya art style continuing uninterrupted through into the early classic or later classic period. But if we turn to the north, we can see the same incipient early borrowing and a full adoption and adaptation of it over a few hundred years. And so that's where I wanna focus uh, my attention today. By starting at Loltun, um, um, just about a hundred years um, after the BC AD transition, um, we get another hiatus, very similar to the hiatus in the South, but then we see Maya writing again at early classic centers like Oshkin Tok and through into the late classic at sites like Etznan, Shkalumkin, Sibil Chaltun, which I didn't include here, um, Ekbalam and Chichen Itza. And so I'd like to talk about them effectively in that sequence, right? Looking at the early adoption and what became of this borrowed writing system and art style in the Northern region. So this is the Loltun cave relief. Um, and we can see here that we're looking at something broadly contemporary, a little later than these developments we saw, but significantly later than the origin of both the writing and the art style in the, to the south, right? And this is um, badly damaged. To some extent, this shows up a little bit clearer in the rubbing that I'm showing you here. Um, and even more clear than the striding figure holding a weapon um, is the short hieroglyphic text. This is a sketch by Alex Tukovanin, where we can see that unfortunately there's not a lot to sink our teeth into here. We've got a date, three chuen, that's probably the day name of this figure. Um, then probably the mom hieroglyph recently deciphered by David Stewart, a title representing an ancestral figure. Um, and then presumably several nominal glyphs, nothing that we can point to to say this is Yucatecan, the language that was spoken up here, or this is, as I think more likely, reflecting Cholan Saltalan, the language of the South. The iconography, thankfully, is quite different. It looks very, very much like elements that have their history and their development further to the South. And here on this very elaborate belt rack of this figure, we can see this same figure with the um, you know, thunderheads um, as its forehead device, the, the jade, the um, 
snake emerging from the mouth representing thunder and lightning, even a teardrop coming out of the eye. This is indeed Chach, right? This foreign derived um, deity, right? Coming up from the south um, to this Northern area. Now we get uh, a couple of centuries of hiatus. We have a few um, um, unprovidence pieces that might well date into that interval, but it's really in the fifth century that we start to see dated and well-providence pieces um, and even more importantly, with lengthy enough texts that we see elements that we can associate with one or another Mayan language, as opposed to thinking of them more generically as just examples of Mayan writing. So our, our date here comes from the opening of this long count um, from the late fifth century, as first analyzed by Alfonso La Cadena. And here we can see a very, very important text that's probably from right around the same time period. Um, and it has a couple of elements that clearly show us the linguistic signature um, that this is written in. We have tun here as a term meaning stone, referring to the lintel that's been carved. And we have the word atot for house, instead of, for those of you that know Yucatec or one of the northern, um, uh, the Yucatecan languages, ototch which would be the expected form. This has vowels that don't agree, ah uh, and o, oh, and a final t. So both of these are indications of an earlier linguistic setting, which is to say the Cholan Seltalan setting. We still we haven't yet had the um, mapping of the two vowels, that is a ah, tot becoming o oh, tot, and we haven't had palatalization of the final element producing o oh, toch yet. These people in northern Yucatan in the fifth century are writing in the language of the inscriptions to the south. They're writing a Cholan Seltalan language, perhaps even an eastern Cholan language, although we can't um, finesse which branch of Cholan uh, we're talking about here. And if we move forward from this, this is the late fifth century, if we leap forward about a hundred years um, to Etzna, um, Stila 22, we can see that the text here records Tzachpach Tun, the stone was erected, and it has two very clear signatures of Cholan Tzeltalan as well. Um, the grammar, the way the passive is formed here, can only make sense in a Cholan linguistic context. And similarly, the Tun, as the word for stone, is Cholan, right? Yucatec itself ends up borrowing the word for Tun from the Cholan language to the south, so that alone wouldn't be a good diagnostic. This could be Yucatecan, but with a borrowed word. But the grammar makes it pretty clear that we're looking at Cholan Seltalan. If we leap forward another 150 years or so um, to the very, very end of the eighth century, um, this is a bone all uh, from Tzibil Chaltun. I'll show you the reason for the date in just a moment, um, but take my word that it's about 790 because of the figure that we see on it that we've identified elsewhere. Um, and we're looking at a text here that names a king, that's Tzibil Chaltun in the north, as Uku Chanchak. Chalk cries in the sky. So this not only has the borrowed um, deity name, right, Chalk, but also has the Cholan phonology of the word Chan and also the U ending, which is an anti-passive that's Cholan in nature. This king in Northern Yucatan has a very Cholan name, right? Um, and the Ch is very, very clearly marked in the word for Chan as it is in the word for Chalk by two different Cha syllables, so being very, very clear that you're pronouncing this foreign name correctly. I said I'd explain where the date came from, and indeed we can see here um, on the stela, two different fragments that make up one monument, a date that places this very, very clearly in 790, and we have the same king's name here, Uku Chan Chak. Once again, the Uku is clear, giving us that anti-passive. The date is given down below in 790. Sorry, I went too fast. Um, the cha key is very clear because it uses a phonetic sign. A little bit more ambiguous is whether the sky sign all by itself as a logogram is meant to be read in one Mayan language versus another. It's very clear though from that other context I just showed you that this king, you were meant to pronounce his name as Chan Chak, not Ka'an Chak for Yucatecan. But the logograms sometimes leave us in a little bit of an ambiguous situation and we have to look to signs nearby and spellings nearby to help us decide which language we're looking at. Okay, let's move forward about another hundred years. On Ushmal, Stila 14, we get another local king of Ushmal, um, whose name ends with Chan Chak once again, right? Chak and in the sky, a verbal action that isn't fully deciphered yet, but maybe pull as has been suggested by, by several individuals. So we see Chan and Chak here, a clear indication of palatalization, 
right? And we're still keeping writing in this foreign language in these Northern inscriptions. Let me move forward to the end of this century at the Osario at Chichen Itza. And here we have that same Tzach Pachtun uh, that we already saw at Etzna, again, writing Cholan, both in the verb and in this particular noun with its sound changes, right? If I um, leap forward now from stone to a text that we have from broadly the 13th century, the Dresden Codex, we get to see here the tail end of this procedure of writing this foreign Southern language in the North, right? Um, we have Tsutsui with a medio passive ending that's only explained in Cholan language. The Khatun ended, Tsutsui Winikab. And we have Yuklach Kab, Yuklach Chen, the earth shook, the caves shook, with a very, very clear affective verbal ending, which also has its history and its explanation in a Cholan etymological situation. So at this point, what we've just walked through is a period of time from the fifth century all the way up to the 13th century, where broadly across this whole Northern region of Yucatan, people are writing in a Cholan language of the South. And at this point, it almost seems tempting to say, well, why is it a foreign language? Maybe this is just the language that was being spoken up there and Yucatecan as it would become is somewhere else, maybe just in a small village and it hasn't spread yet, but don't go too fast. It's actually very clear that Yucatecan was the vernacular up in this region um, from several pieces of evidence. But let me give you one that comes right out of the writing itself. If we remember that we see good evidence of Cholan, a Southern language being written in these borrowed hieroglyphs in the North, starting in the fifth century, it takes a few centuries before we actually see evidence of this writing system being used to write a local vernacular different from the Cholan. The earliest one presently um, clear in, in terms of date, although it may actually um, go back maybe a couple of decades earlier than this, but broadly in the mid to late eighth century, um, we actually for the first time see a departure from these inscriptions to the south. So instead of this earlier yatot, or in fact, even a more broadly classic yotot, we finally see yototch being written um, here at Shkalomkin um, in 771. And again, maybe this process of writing Yucatecan in the inscriptions begins a couple of decades earlier than this, but broadly, we're talking about at least three centuries where in the North, they were writing the Southern language before they're using the syllabic conventions and phonetic complements to indicate that they're writing something different. As we'll see in a moment, they continue doing so after this period through the eighth century and through the ninth century and continuing, it seems, up until we start to see some evidence of writing during the colonial period in the 16th century. But um, Right now, what we have to contemplate is a period of time in Northern Yucatan where this borrowed writing system from the South was being written for three centuries in a foreign language, even as people were speaking another language in day-to-day -day life. And then over time, their own vernacular seemed to become prestigious enough that it entered into um, their actual written language. This is something that linguists call diglossia. Right? It refers to uh, the use within a single speech community of two or more languages, one or more vernacular languages, and then a prestige language. Each of these languages has certain spheres of social interaction that are assigned to it, and any given sphere usually has only one socially acceptable language. So we're imagining a situation where everybody is speaking an ancestral form of Yucatecan day to day, perhaps in the market or in the home, but um, in the court and in the language of writing and record keeping, it is the language that traveled to the north with the writing system that was borrowed from the south. Right? Now, there are many great studies of diglossia. Some of the best documented cases that are relevant here are, of course, Cantonese contrasted with written Mandarin today. If you're familiar with the Middle Ages and even up until the early modern period, various European vernaculars like English and French and German contrasted with Latin, which until you know, the last hundred years was regarded as the language of scholarship and indeed the language that was attached to the Roman alphabet that's now being used to write all of these European vernaculars today. Still earlier, Etruscan at its height contrasted with Latin as it rose and eventually swallowed that language. This needn't be the outcome of a situation of diglossia, but it can be one of the outcomes. It doesn't seem to be the outcome in terms of Yucatecan versus Cholan, since Yucatecan has various uh, languages as its descendants today. Um, so it's much more like Cantonese contrasted with Mandarin, or indeed various European vernaculars contrasted with Latin, than it is like Etruscan 
contrasted with Latin. Very often too, this situation of diglossia is something that comes up in the context of the borrowing of writing systems. We can see that, for instance, in the borrowing of the Chinese script by the Japanese, um, and indeed to write several scripts in the Japanese tradition, not just the kanji, but the hiragana and the katakana, all three of those scripts having an origin in the logographic signs of the earlier Chinese writing system. Um, early on, at its genesis, the Chinese script is very isolating with individual pictorial logograms, very similar to the genesis of, of many writing systems around the world. But as many of you are no doubt familiar, the characters that are part of the Chinese script today tended to combine two or more of these early logograms together in slightly different ways. The most popular way to combine these early signs is to have one do the kind of semantic work, right? So a word for mother involving a glyph that referred to a woman and another one that gave a clue to the sound. So since ma was the word for horse, that's tolerably similar to the word for mother, even though they have different tones. And now we have a character. Some 90% of common signs in Chinese are of this type, combining a semantic element with a phonetic one. Now, this element was borrowed lock, stock, and barrel as a single unit to write the Japanese kanji as a term for mother. One pronunciation of with is haha for mother. Um, and you can see there's no input of that early ma sign at all. It's just sitting there as kind of a fossil, a vestigial organ that relates to the sound system of Chinese and is now ignored in understanding and reading it in Japanese. We'll see that Maya borrowing, borrowings of signs in Northern Yucatan are similar in some ways to that. Another common combining feature is to take two semantic inputs, the sun and the moon, which aren't used to mean sun and moon, but for an element that they share, in this case, their brightness to make a word for bright. Now, Japanese borrowed signs like this and sometimes borrowed, in, in the time they were borrowed, uh, Chinese pronunciation, right, um, of these particular forms. It's called on reading. But other times they had their own native term for bright. In this case, akarui would be one of those. And we can add kana signs to give us an indication of how to pronounce that. So you're looking at the early logogram here. And to make sure you don't read this in one of several ways that this kanji can be pronounced, ru and e are added to tell you, oh, this is the word akarui for bright that's intended. About 7% of Chinese signs that are commonly used are of this type. Of, uh, of this type. Rebus, where a depiction of one thing, like for instance, a, a, a strand of wheat here, right? Um, to represent just the sound lai, um, which happens to have a homophone of the verb to come, represents something like 3% of common signs in that particular system. But these are also borrowed. And also they can take phonetic complements to indicate how they're supposed to be pronounced in the deriving language. So we'll see that when we take the Maya glyphs from their original linguistic context, to write any other Mayan language, we can do the same thing. Um, we can ignore some elements that are present there and give indications of how they're supposed to be pronounced, or we can add phonetic complements to tell us how these work. And, and so in that respect, um, this is actually a pretty good model um, to follow um, for what we're looking at. Um, in particular, we can look at a modern day example from the 1980s forward when Nikolai Gruber and Linda Sheely uh, collaborated to teach classic Cholan hieroglyphs to speakers of Eastern Mayan languages. Um, there, were, uh, there was a period of time when, of course, the system from the, south, from the Southern Lowlands had to be adapted to write different um, Mayan languages of the Kichayan uh, branch. And we can see this in monuments from 2012 and works of uh, poetry and literature that are coming forward now in hieroglyphs writing various Eastern Mayan languages. This is the Ishin Che stila erected in 2012, and it's written in Kakchikel. And obviously there's some challenges to writing Kakchikel with a system that was designed and has its signs um, originally built and elaborated to write the Cholan uh, Maya language. Um, in particular, there are sounds that exist in the highland languages that don't in the lowlands. Like for instance, the uvular q made further back in the mouth than typical velars in the, in the um, Cholan um, texts, and an r which isn't present in uh, Cholan Tzeltalan languages. And so what they did was a basic sign like ku could be marked with this diacritic to tell us now pronounce it as a uvular q because no uvular signs existed. And similarly, U could be used to write Ru by being, marking, being marked with the same diacritic. 
right? This is a very modern kind of analysis of how writing systems work, the use of diacritics. And we don't find diacritics modifying syllabic signs um, when the Yucatec speakers adopted the Cholan inscriptions or when other groups did. Um, but it gives you a good example of one type of an adaptation that we might look for and, and see whether it was present anciently. Another one that's much more common and that we do see and that we've just seen in the borrowing of the ja uh, Chinese um, characters to write the kanji in Japan is that all absent any other kind of indications, we would assume that this is the logogram keen for sun, this hoon for paper, tun for stone, and then chak and winik for red or great and person. But when a phonetic complement is added that doesn't make any sense in the Cholan language, but rather does in Kichean, we know we're not supposed to read this as keen, but rather kuch, um, not as huun, but rather wuch, and so on, which is precisely what we see in the deriving of these kanji with phonetic complements to indicate that they have Japanese pronunciations rather than Chinese pronunciations. The difference being here, of course, that Kakchikel is related um, to other Mayan languages like Cholan, but distantly related enough that the sound patterns are different, the words are different, right? Interestingly, there's every indication that this modern obstacle, right, if using these ancient Cholan inscriptions or texts to write modern Kakchikel is something that different Maya peoples have um, overcome at different time periods. It explains in particular a set of interesting intriguing spellings that I'm working on a paper on right now with Hari Ketunen um, in the Relacion de las Cosas de Yucatan from the 16th century. Of course, this book is famous for providing us uh, the Landa alphabet, but equally fascinating is a list of months, so-called. These are 20 day periods, right? Ventenas um, in the Maya system. Um, and here all given in their Yucatec names because the names are different in different Mayan languages. What's fascinating though, is we have elaborate spellings for these month names. So here's the month pop and look at how many different signs are used to write pop. Something's going on here. Uh, an explanation of why you need one, two, three, four, five different signs to write something that we can write with three letters, right? Is that two different languages are actually being written here. The core of this is the way that the month Kanhalau, the Cholan name for the same month, the first month of the calendar, had been written for hundreds of years in the South before it was ever borrowed in the North with the elements Kan and Chal and Wa spelling Kanhalau. And we see all of that here. So this is just writing the way this month was written for hundreds of years and the way the people in the North undoubtedly learned to write it. But then this obliging scribe in the 16th century provided for Landa two syllables out in front to say, well, we don't pronounce it kanhalau, we pronounce it pop, right? And it's a good indication that probably this was regularly read in many contexts in the North simply as pop, even though you could take it apart and realize that it had the elements kan and hal and wa in it, in exactly the same way that the ma horse sign could be ignored in Japanese inscriptions as not providing that sound, but simply being part of a larger constellation that meant the glyph for mother, right? Here, the glyph for that month, but here with a little bit of a clue as to how it's pronounced. Several of the month names work in the same way. So the second month of the calendar is given as ikat in the south, which is its name. And that's written here as ik plus at, right? just a variant spelling of the same thing without a final phonetic complement, but added to it, that I've colored in here in blue, is the syllable wo, right? Telling us indeed that that's the pronunciation. Don't make too much of this V, by the way. The V was just for the sound W in the 16th century. The doble V hadn't been invented yet as a special sign to write a W-like sound in most, most European scripts derived from the Roman alphabet. So, one thing that's fascinating here is just the time depth this have. It's not just a question of a scribe that was assisting the Franciscan friar Diego de Landa to understand Maya writing um, in the 16th century, but as we'll see in a moment, this practice goes all the way back to the 9th century, right? So it has a long time depth in Yucatan. And to show you that, I want to turn to Chichen Itza, um, where just south of the Castillo or the Temple of Kukulkan, you can see the Casa Colorada and the Monjas. And I'll start here um, at the Monjas. 
here in a beautiful watercolor um, illustration by Tatiana Proskuryakov. And it's this upper temple that's interesting. Um, this construction was later covered by a staircase and then a temple that mounted on top of that, covering over doorways that you can still access through a little passageway behind the steps. So these doorways originally had five forward facing rooms and then one room to each side, each with a lintel. And this is sort of paradigmatically what all these lintels looked like with a carved underside and a carved front, if you will, that would face you. And what's fascinating about them is that all of them reflect the exact same date and dedicatory sequence, although different nobles of the site, um, ruler and several relatives are all related here. And although there's some erosion, we can compare and contrast all seven of these to fully understand the inscription. So it's a very lengthy text at this one moment and that gives us a lot of insight. So I'm going to boil away most of these and just compare the three central ones, uh, lintels three, four, and five here. And you can see that we have some erosion, but we can pick that up in other places, right? We have some missing elements, but we can see that more clearly. And so what we're looking at here is eight, the day sign manik, um, the, the word for day, keen, and then two, a preposition plus a, um, a ordinalizer are giving us in the 15th, of the month Ikhat, which we've just seen. So the day eight Manik on the 15th of Ikhat. But it's not just the early form of the South Ikhat, which is written. Just like in the Landa manuscript, we get the syllable wo plus an e, which is actually a deictic particle, saying that thing I just mentioned, Ikhat, is wo, right? On eight Manik on the 15th of Ikhat, which is wo. In other words, what we call wo. This is a Yucatecan speaker talking about a calendrical um, apparatus that he's inherited from inscriptions to the south. Here in the ninth century, and here surviving as a practice that continued into the 16th century. It had hundreds of years of history and was even in the ninth century, an inheritance going all the way back to the fifth, right? When the writing system was borrowed from the culture to the south. Now we can see an interesting interplay of some of these features in the Casa Colorada hieroglyphic band. So this is that other building that I showed you on the map of Chichen. And if we look at Catherwood's floor plan here, it's in the first room that we can see just at the um, vault spring, a long text that Catherwood tells us is 40 feet long. This is a long inscription um, that's 12 meters um, in length to use the measuring system I'm more familiar with as a Canadian, right? Some 40 feet or 12 meters um, in length. And here is Annie Hunter's exquisite drawing, a detailed drawing of the late 19th century. So again, one long band, even though that's impossible to represent here without you being able to see what it is. Um, and because again, it's a very lengthy text, fairly well preserved and in one context, right? Um, we can say a fair bit more about it than we can about some other more typically short inscriptions um, in Northern Yucatan. And here I'm drawing um, on a recent um, study Photo photography and, and drawing of, of Bruce Love and Alfonso Lacadena's analysis of some elements of this inscription. And I'll point to some specific parts of those um, in just a moment. So we can see features that we've seen several times over. So for instance, here we have a verb, uk, the verb to cry again, um, with wu following it as uk hu. And that's that Cholin Seltalan anti-passive. And in fact, married to it is a deity name, Kawil. Now, Kawil um, has a phonology that works perfectly fine in northern Yucatan and in Cholan, but I think there's very little doubt that this is another borrowed deity, part and parcel of the early iconography of Chak of the south. It just happens to have a sound in it that it can't immediately be traced to Cholan, but it seems um, without doubt that the early iconography, the um, full figure glyphs and portraits of the glyph have their history in the south. And of course, in the north, it's written syllabically. It's very a, a huge rarity in the south. So writing this as ka we la in the north um, is a good indication that they interpret it as being a little bit foreign in some way, right? And that's not to say that the deity wasn't um, embraced, right? Clearly, we have a god being worshipped in northern Yucatan that has this name. And those of you that are familiar um, with the capstones, right, that are present all across northern Yucatan are undoubtedly familiar with the fact that Kawil is a favored subject, uh, a depiction. As Simon Martin has shown 
This is the deity that rescued chocolate and jade and other goodies from the underworld and was clearly a key figure of the iconography and indeed of the mythology and religious culture of Northern Yucatan, but seems to be a Southern borrowing. So, so far we've seen a deity name that has both a grammatical and a lexical indication of its debt to the South. But there's more going on here in this text as, as Alfonso La Cadena was the first to demonstrate in a series of papers of the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, one thing that he pointed out, for instance, is that a very, very widespread verb for drilling fire, hoch, has a very unexpected ending here that we see in no inscription of the South, right? Um, written with the syllable B, this gives us hoch B. And the context tells us this must be intransitive in some way. Here it's most likely a passive, and it has its only explanation in an ancestral proto yucatecan passive, originally an ab that would have been sync syncopated here. Hoch ab with this e becomes hoch b in pronunciation. So the running verb here has a yucatecan ending that makes sense in yucatecan, but not in cholan, okay, um, here in the ninth century. And similarly, um, in this text where we have Hakupakal is the one who conjured by means of his heat, of his self, of his something else, right? Um, his vital essence, right? We have an ending that once again only makes sense in Yucatecan. It's an anti-passive and it looks nothing like the vowel, vowel, W, right? Ending tsakao, or even like the vowel, vowel, N for non-CVC transitives of Cholan languages to the south. This grammar is ancestral to forms that we still see in both Western Yucatecan and even conserved into parts of Eastern Yucatecan, right? And yet at one and the same time that we have hochbi and tsaka, we also have these foreign uh, theophoric names, right? God-bearing names. So both the name of a deity worshipped here in the inscription in the Casa Colorado, and here the high king of the site of Chichen Itza at this time, Kakupakal Kawil. Notice the Kawil, the foreign deity name. Now, what seemed then like a little bit of a disconnect that you would have a Cholan deity name, right? And a Cholan king name, but Yucatecan verbs makes more sense when we recognize that the names are a cultural debt right, um, to the origins of religion and complex society in northern Yucatan in some measure, right? In the same way that Queen Elizabeth, right, today, right, um, on the throne in England, right, um, has a theophoric name that is, uh, goes back to the biblical Hebrew, Elisheva, right, God is my oath, with El being the name of Elohim, God, right? We can't assume that just because Elizabeth's name is Elizabeth that she speaks biblical Hebrew, right? Um, or, you know, if she's able to read or, or, or write biblical Hebrew, I don't know, but that she would speak it on a daily basis. And the same is very, very much true of Kakupakal Kawil. He has a name that reflects a cultural debt. At this point in the ninth century, a long pattern of naming of individuals using theophoric names involving Chach and Kawil that entered northern Yucatan from the south 400 years before this inscription is written. But the living language at this time, even though foreign names like Elizabeth are being cited here, um, is Yucatecan, as we can see from the grammatical ending in Hochbi, in Sakach, and intriguingly, in a later passage of the inscription, where we talk first about the drilling of fire, but then the second coming of fire, the third coming of fire, and the fourth coming of fire. And where the third coming is represented by the number three, represented by three dots, and the fourth by the number four, represented by four dots, the number two is represented by the syllable ka, telling us that that's the pronunciation of the number two in this text. And ka is ancestral to the Yucatec languages today, right? Yucatecan, Yucatec Lacandon, Itza Nopan, not to Cholan, which already had that k to ch sound shift. Right? So they're telling us with verbal endings and the number two and a few other elements scattered throughout this inscription that this is a text that's being written in you know, pre-proto-Yucatecan in the ninth century AD, right? After some 400 years of writing in the foreign language from the South. So let me turn just quickly, the last couple of slides to Ekbalam, um, another site intensively studied um, uh, epigraphically and linguistically by Alfonso La Cadena, and in particular to the mural of the 96 glyphs. Um, and what we're looking at here is the arrival at Ekbalam, was even called that anciently, as we can see from the text here, um, the herald of a foreign king named Chakhutu Chanek, 
the holy Echma Lord, the Northern Columte, and Bacab. And it was this herald of this foreign king who summons what will become the local king and the founder of a dynasty at Ekbalan named Ukit Kanlek, several of his titles. And then we even get a scribal signature of two scribes that worked on this inscription and associated art. Now what's fascinating here is the very different linguistic setting of the two names. The high king, the overlord, is named in classical Cholam. He has an anti-passive name. He has a clear indication that Chan is the word for sky in his name. And the vassal, the local king, is named Ukit Kanlek, where all of these Ks that I've highlighted here are the Yucatecan cognates of what should be Chuz in the South. Cheat should be this term rather than Kit. Chan for the number four instead of Khan, and uh, Lech instead of Lech um, for this numeral classifier counting individual uh, pieces of flint. You can't see it there where just the number four is used as a separate sign, but here where we get both Ka and Na uh, to spell the, the word for the number four, we're clearly talking about Yucatecan. So this text, some decades earlier than what we looked at at the Monjas, and at the Casa Colorado Chichen Itza shows us um, a sort of a division of labor and this association of both a royal figure and also scribal individuals with this foreign language um, and a moment crystallizing a distinction between Yucatecan speakers whose names are actually in a Yucatecan language as opposed to these foreign impacted names um, from the South. Now, what I've done here is I focus primarily on how writing from the Cholan Saltalan area in the South came to the North because we have so much data from the North and growing amounts of data from ongoing archeological excavations. But you saw a glimpse of how we could talk about this towards the South as well into the Eastern Maya area. And indeed another talk could look at Saltalan and how it percolates upwards in various vernaculars and inscriptions in Chiapas in the late classic period. If I were to consider all of those regions, and if I had two hours instead of an hour, I might have titled this talk Cholan Contributions to Pan-Mayan Culture. And that's also an appropriate talk if we consider all of the Maya hieroglyphic inscriptions that are being written today. Just recently, the entirety of the Popol Wu was written in Quiche using Maya hieroglyphs. Um, Cholan hieroglyphs developed all the way back in the middle of the first millennium BC, adapted and elaborated to write any of the modern Mayan languages um, that we have present. Um, a, a long-standing contribution of this ancient group of Cholan speakers. Now, I really wish that instead of giving this from New Orleans, I was giving this talk uh, from Boundary End itself. I thought I'd share a couple of images here as also a reminder uh, for me to thank both Max for the kind invitation and uh, the board at the Boundary End Archaeology Research Center um, for extending that invitation to me. I imagine that if I were there, I might be, might be presenting this from uh, the, the library. And this is also a, a good segue uh, to urge those of you who are able um, to make a contribution uh, to help uh, this important initiative that Max will explain here in a moment in much more detail. Um, if you enjoyed my talk, please consider um, supporting um, the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center. If you didn't, enjoy my talk, it's even more important that you support the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center so that they can entice um, even better speakers um, to give future monthly talks um, for the center. Thank you so much. And I'll pass the mic on to uh, Max before we take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, can, you, um, um, can you maybe stop sharing your screen for a hot yes. second, Mark? Thank you. All right, so uh, here at the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center, we are building programs to support scholars and their research on the ancient Americas. Uh, we specialize on the Southeastern United States, uh, on Mesoamerica, broadly speaking, and in the greater Andes uh, regions. Um, currently, we are hosting two George Seward residential scholars in the library, including uh, Ashuni, who is uh, behind uh, the technical commands of this talk. So thank you very much. To, uh, to Ashwini. Um, and so uh, we have uh, big plans for the future, uh, including um, uh, renovations, conservation of the library collection and support for our uh, George Stewart Residential Scholar programs and relaunching our visiting scholar program, uh, hopefully as soon as this pandemic allows that. We are excited to announce that through August 1st, 
every donation up to $25,000 will be matched by the Culvert Memorial Fund. So now is the perfect time to support the center and automatically double your gift. Uh, so uh, this will make also uh, any gift is tax deductible uh, since it is a, we are a not-for-profit. So just visit our website at bannerynn.com or click the link that is visible uh, below uh, the stock. If you go show, if you hit show more uh, below uh, the Bannery and Archaeology Research Center logo uh, and on YouTube, you will be able to get a direct link to our um, uh, donate donate button. Um, also, I want to mention that if you want to also help us in, in another way, you can also just uh, like uh, our uh, YouTube channel. That also that's a small thing that can help us uh, get a little more exposure eventually. We we hope to reach a, a thousand uh, subscribers. So please subscribe to our uh, channel. We currently have 555. So we still have a little bit to go. All right. And so, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Mark, for this great uh, lecture. There have been um, many questions. Okay. Uh, there's actually, uh, I, I can tell you that this is by far the most lively discussion I've ever seen. Uh, not only questions, but uh, people talking with each other. That's really cool. Uh, so thank you, everyone, nice. uh, for that. Um, so there are uh, so many questions that there's no way I'm going to be able to ask them all. Uh, but I will, um, I'll do my best. Uh, Mark, also, at some point, I will ask you, uh, uh, please check your email if you can. Uh, one of the questions I can't ask, uh, really, because it includes um, Chinese uh, signs. Um, oh, so great. If you, yeah, if, if, I, if will, you, I will do that, yes. <laughs> if you want to check your email, I took a screenshot, um, and you'll have to zoom in a bit. Uh, the name of the person asking the question is written itself in, in Chinese. Perfect. I will, I will look at that. Thank you. Oh, you seem to have frozen, Max, or at least you have on my end. All right. So okay. there was um, Larry Lowe um, asked the first question. So I will go ahead and ask this one. Uh, so uh, wondering, um, he was wondering if you were going to talk about it. And I think you did a bit, but uh, if you want to extend maybe on the presence of Yucatecan phonology showing up in Palenque, if you can comment on that, if there was any. Uh... You no, know, that's, that's fascinating. This, this issue of the palatalization change from an earlier k sound to a ch, right? The same kind of change we see historically in French derived from Latin. Um, as a result of knowing that that's a Cholin feature, many places where we see a k later than we might have originally expected have long been thought to be the result of Yucatecan influence. So things like kab, for instance, at, at uh, Palenque, um, kuch as the word for God. We now understand those a little bit better as a piece of evidence of a later change from k to ch in those places. And so most of us don't feel that we're looking at Yucatecan influence at Palenque anymore, but a kind of holdover um, of this earlier state of affairs before that that change became widespread and showed up everywhere in the writing. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. The, the, the concept of the glossia was really interesting to several of the attendees of the talk. Um, so, um, and there were some, some discussion regarding the similarities between Yucatec and Jyoti. And yeah. someone was wondering maybe if um, the adoption by the Yucatec uh, speakers um, of the Chorti script might be related to kind of the, the reason that the fact that the languages are somewhat uh, close together uh, versus other ling Mayan languages, which are um, more different uh, from, from, uh, from Chorti than Yucatec is. That's a really, really good point. I mean, uh, they're, they're from different branches. The languages aren't mutually intelligible, but they shared um, frontiers and probably you know, bilingual situations and contact for so many centuries that there's huge amounts of shared vocabulary. So much so that even though we know that we're looking at a Cholan uh, language in the early classic inscriptions, we, we are still helped a lot by the um, lexical lists, the dictionaries of you know, Yucatec, uh, Lacandon, Itza, and Mopan, because they share so many words in so many forms. So there undoubtedly was, after a long period of mixing and association, more familiarity than might be immediately thought, even between these otherwise mutually unintelligible languages, that surely um, facilitated, you know, uh, somebody in a court in northern Yucatan writing in this foreign language, since there would have been some similarities there um, already. Thanks. Um, then uh, someone um, uh, who goes uh, by uh, on YouTube uh, by uh, Botanical Boy 
uh, <laughs> said, uh, <laughs> said uh, I, I, ironically, in present-day Belize, this diglosia still happens, but with completely different languages, with English being the prestige language and Creole being the lingua franca. Yeah, very much so. If you'll find diglossia everywhere, and diglossia is a useful term because it does refer to you know many languages as opposed to you know specifically two, and so you find very complex linguistic situations where you've got three or even four languages that are tasked to different social functions uh, within a speech community, and in many places around the world, it's not even very different languages that are associated with those. It can actually be dialects of the same language. You know, so when you see a public lecture at a university or in politics, the idea is that you've got a kind of elevated discourse using a different register of English than you might use or feel comfortable using at a bar with your friends, for instance. So even variants of exactly the same language can be tasked to different social functions. Here we're looking at different languages, albeit related ones, tasked to those different norms, right? Court speech versus everyday speech in presumably a Northern Yucatecan context. Yeah. And then uh, speaking of uh, relationship between different languages, uh, Leonard Van O uh, was thinking uh, that um, he kind of uh, was under the impression that Mandarin and Cantonese were, were um, more different uh, from one another than uh, Yucatec and, and, and uh, Chukti. It would be hard to put a number on how different they are. They're both related languages. They're part of the Sinaitic language family. They are very different though. I mean, you know, Cantonese for one thing has more tones. Um, it has also a lot of borrowings from other Chinese languages in its vicinity um, than, than the Mandarin does. Uh, Mandarin has a lot of archaic forms that have changed in all of the other um, Chinese language, undoubtedly because of its association with the writing system. I'm not sure if, you know, classical you know, Cholti, and it's sometimes been called, or Eastern Cholan, um, would have been all that similar to pre-Proto Yucatecan of the North. Um, but even if they were, you know, somewhat more similar to one another, we know that diglossia can occur even in situations where you have very, very closely related languages. As I was just saying, two dialects of the same language, uh, for instance. So, difference in the languages involved is no obstacle to that uh, penetration um, or, or alteration over time. Okay, thank you. And then I think, do you have access to your email? Did you open it, the question I was oh, mentioning? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I yeah that, uh, it might be a good time to talk about it right now because that question seemed to be related to, uh, since we're on the topic of, of, of Chinese script. Oh, I'm, I'm zooming in, but it gets so um, blurred that I can't read uh, you don't, it. Oh, yeah, oh. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I, then that question won't be. But it was in, in reference to the word mother in Japanese, hanji is not the same with, with Chinese because of a difference in the sign uh, yeah. for haha -ha versus uh, or okasan. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, there was a, 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 a moment. And so I qualified exactly, you know, what, what time period and also what form um, of usage it is. But there was a time period where that exact sign, the one that was the sign for mother was used within Japanese. But of course there's been new signs um, and tasking of new values to signs over time. Sorry that the, the image uh, didn't uh, carry no, over. No but... problem, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, Spino uh, JP says, the present day Chontal and Chol region are far separated from the current uh, Chofti region. Uh, they are both geographically isolated by many areas of distinct Mayan languages. How can we explain the separation from closely related languages? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, there are several confounding factors that take what had been this broad belt of Cholan that I, you know, I think I colored it blue on that on that map, going all the way from, you know, Chorti still spoken today at the border between southeastern Guatemala and Honduras, all the way up to Chontal in the Chontalpa, um, the lowlands of Tabasco. Um, in part, um, we know from these early, you know, 17th century and 18th century sources that there were other Cholan languages that no longer exist spoken all through that zone in between. So the Akala Chol spoke a variant of Cholti, the Tokegwa on the coast, um, other groups um, in between the Manche Chol speaking the Manche Cholti, um, and these other groups to the west, including the Lacandon Chol, which is now a little bit confusing because we have Lacandon as one of the um, variants of Yucatecan, but the Lacandon term goes back even earlier, and there was a group of Eastern Cholan speakers that called themselves the Lacantuan or the Lacandon. So there were other Cholan languages that haven't left descendants unless they've done it as loan words into other languages or even into other varieties of Cholan. Then there was also the nucleation intentional 
um, during the colonial period where the Spanish took um, various different Maya groups living in a broader area and concentrated them in towns around missions um, and did the reducciones that produce these kind of isolated moments what it, which over what had once been a more analogical spread of languages in a broader uh, dialect continuum. So we have some direct evidence of these other Cholwan uh, languages that are now gone. Um, and we have some indications that this wide separation between them was a product of, of the time period of colonization. Good. Thank you, Mark. Um, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, here, um, the uh, someone named uh, Shermanator Osborne is asking in, in reference to uh, the, Di the Diego de Landa Auto da Fe is, is wondering if you have any idea how many books were burned. Yeah, there's, there's no way in that particular action at Mani to know how much was burned or of what type. We know that a lot of idols um, were burned, for instance. We don't know if there were more of these wooden idols than there might have been of actual books and, and texts. That said, there are a couple of great papers by John Chuchiak, which I would encourage you to look up, which talks about not just the Auto da Fe, um, but talks about several episodes over a hundred year period of confiscations of books from various towns in Northern Yucatan by the authorities, um, their destruction, their transmittal to Spain, um, that speaks to a more programmatic, wide-scale dismantling of the literature that would have still been present in the earlier colonial period. So we often point to that one moment as Landa burning all the books that had ever existed, but he could never have done that. There were much too, ma much too many of them. Um, but he and many acolytes and many others did so over a 75 to 100 year period in towns all over the North. And that was when we lost most of the literature in, in perishable media. Um, and I don't think there's any way to put an overall figure. He puts a number on the accounts that we have, but each of those is at the tip of the iceberg again, representing many other places that we simply don't have a record of what was constant, uh, confiscated from whom, uh, how much text it had or anything of that nature. Certainly there was a continuation of the script though, or we wouldn't have this very, very useful um, uh, moment, right? In the relacion itself of the alphabet, month spellings, the names of the calendar, all of which is perfectly accurate, indicating that until the 1560s, there were people that knew how to write on paper um, in the Maya script. Yes, uh, that's a complex question. And uh, I think we continue to understand how complex the answer must be. Um, uh, there's another question from Botanical Boy, uh, who says, uh, what are your thoughts on the revival of Maya script in the Yucatan in order to write contemporary Maya Tan? Uh, is it possible, you think it's logistically possible? And as a follow-up, do you have any suggestion uh, to uh, make it more uh, um, palatable or easily understandable to the public uh, to make it and to make it sustainable uh, in usage? No, no, absolutely great questions. It, it not only can be done, it is being done. So just for reasons of time, I had to cut out some other great examples of the revitalization of Maya script to write other branches of Mayan languages. Um, and because I was focusing so much on the North and Yucatec, and I took out a couple of examples of modern Yucatec, actually Mayatan being written um, with hieroglyphs. One was also erected in 2012, the Mani Stila, um, which is written in modern Mayatan using uh, Maya hieroglyphs and with very, very similar kinds of conventions as we saw Kakchikel um, being written in Maya hieroglyphs. And um, my, my colleague and friend, um, 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 uh, Guillermo Cantun, Memo Cantun, has written Yucatec poems in Maya hieroglyphs with actually a couple of conventions of his own, which I think are very, very artistic for representing some sounds and, and elements that weren't present in the, um, um, the Cholan uh, uh, derived uh, hieroglyphic script. And so you can find great examples online and on Facebook of uh, people writing Maya Tan uh, using uh, Cholan uh, derived um, hieroglyphs. And I imagine that will only continue. And some works that we've seen in this revived uh, Maya writing are just absolutely beautiful um, examples of Maya calligraphy. And I can think of examples that are that match up against some of the best works from the ninth century um, in several branches of Mayan, writing um, Tzotzil, writing Tzutuhil and Kapchikel, and writing Yucatec, Maya Tan. All right.
right um, before the cops come and arrest you, Mark. Uh, I can <laughs> yeah. hear them in the background. I'll yeah, ask you one last. I'll, <laughs> I'll ask you one last question. Um, so uh, Stephanie Lozano says, "Great talk, Mark." Mark, uh, at the beginning, you mentioned that the iconography of Chuck was first uh, developed in Central Patan and then traveled to the Pacific Coast. Can could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, when we trace these elements, it's important to realize that we're not just looking at the earliest attestation of something like an icon of Chah, right? Because if we were to do so, that would always leave us open to the potential that we're not looking at the actual earliest, we're just looking at the earliest which survives. And how do we know it wasn't further to the south? But there's actually a close relationship at any time period between Maya art and Maya writing. So what something like a, a portrait of Chah looks like in art looks precisely the same as his logogram or full figure glyph looks like in writing. This is probably because the artists and the uh, writers were one and the same person. This, we find works of art where the iconography and the writing are all done by the same scribe, the same artist, right? Um, and so we can see this close relationship of the writing system with the art. And so we find the earliest iterations of both in the central Paten, right? Northern Guatemalan context and then we find it, of course, later, um, along with a derived um, writing system in the southern areas and, and the northern areas. So that's one of the one of the trajectories. We also, of course, find this writing writing a foreign language. So we find Cholan written on monuments at Kaminahuyu, and we find Cholan written in texts in the early classic period in northern Yucatan. So that really suggests this derivation from a foreign context. One thing I didn't mention that this is a good, a good place to, to, to segue into is that one of the reasons for focusing on being able to um, trace, you know, where the writing system was adopted from, what language is its writing, is that because of the meticulous dating of Mayan inscriptions, we can often talk about, you know, where it was derived from, where it developed to and how. And more importantly, though, we can use that as a proxy for other kinds of cultural relationships. So because we find the writing system derived from the South, that is an, an illiterate Northern Yucatan picking up writing from the South to become literate, writing in this foreign tradition and borrowing along with it ideas of the gods, Chah and Kawil, religious patterns, patterns of rule and political culture, all of these things we have to imagine as the, the great iceberg sitting below the surface. We can track by date and by place and by site the hieroglyphs and the language, but what we're fascinated by is even more than that. All of the other cultural elements that translated from this you know, southern classic Cholan civilization, which collapsed in the ninth century AD, but has a continuing life in areas to the south, areas to the north and to the west, outside of the area. Um, where it was first developed. Thanks for that question, Stephanie. All right, well, Mark, um, I will let you uh, probably go home and eat dinner. Uh, and thank you so much um, for uh, joining uh, us for our uh, virtual lecture series on the ancient Americans. Um, our next uh, lecture uh, will uh, be by uh, Ashuni, who will be uh, telling us uh, about his uh, research in the highlands of Mexico. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I'm excited for that. Uh, maybe Ashuni, you can, uh, you, you, if, you, if, you, if you dare, uh, si, 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 si quieres tal vez mostrarte la cara y, y, y decirnos rápidamente lo que va a ser el subjecto de, de, de tu ponencia. Um, Hola Max, hola Mark. Eh, sí. Es, es sobre mi investigación en un sitio que está en el corredor teotihuacano en Tlaxcala, eh, un sitio del clásico con relación con Teotihuacán. Sería eso, la plática de julio, mediados de julio, finales de julio. Sorry, there's a, there's a dog in the background. But uh, yeah, so uh, Ashuni Manuel Romero Butron is our, uh, one of our two current um, Uh, George Stewart Residential Scholar, and that will be uh, his talk. So looking forward to that, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And I think it's time for us to uh, say goodbye. All right. See y'all in July. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Max. Take care. <laughs>